Hello, Internet. We're running a little behind today. Uh, we'll get started here in just a minute or two uh, while we wait for some folks to sign on. We're just going to be waiting here a little bit. Um, started, signed on a little late. Um, we'll give some folks some more time to join here before we get started. Um, so we're going to probably start in like two or three minutes here. Um, unless they're making coffee here in the church. And so we'll wait for the coffee to be made before we get started with Bible study. So again, <coughs> two or three minutes before we get started. Um, just running a couple minutes behind today. So go grab yourself a cup of coffee or tea or whatever beverages you drink on a Wednesday night. Um, and we'll get started here in just a couple minutes. Oh my. All right, Jenny. Hi, Mike. Good to see you. Evening, Judy. Good to see you. Um, yeah, we'll get started here in a couple minutes. I wonder how many times I can say that in the next couple minutes here. Uh, I bet if you try real hard, maybe... Can everybody hear me okay online? Um, we'll make sure we get this right. I can keep track of comments if you like. Yeah, that's fine. Otherwise, I gotta you see them ahead of time. To warn me when they're there. I, I can read them on my computer here. Like Flag on the play. Great, thanks. Um, yeah. So this is a message for future you. Because I know a lot of people like to watch this Bible study um, later on in the week when they have time. Um, and so if you're watching this when it's not streamed live, and if you have questions about the stuff that we talk about here, um, I'm still happy to talk about it. Uh, you can go ahead and, and call the church and I'll talk to you, or you can send me an email or a Facebook message or message the church. i um, be happy to answer your questions, um, even, even a few days later. It's not, not a big deal. Um, and if you do type them in the comments a couple of days later, I try to read them. Um, but if I miss your comments, just, you know, Grab me aside at church or send me a message and we'll be sure to answer them um, as best as we can. <coughs> uh, coffee's almost done. Uh, no, I'm good. Thanks. I've got some, some juice here. Um, so we'll get started then. Wait, flag on the plane. Distributing Bibles. Okay, we're good to go. We've got the thumbs up, we're good to go. All right, let's get started then. <laughs> uh, okay, so last week, um, if you were here, uh, we talked about this Italian, what's the word, philosopher. Um, his name was, was Gramsci, that was his, his, last, his last name. Uh, and he was uh, thrown into prison um, because he was a socialist and he was thrown in prison by the communists um, under, under Mussolini back during World War II. And while he was sitting in prison as a, as a political prisoner, uh, he was trying to think of ways to make Marxism work. He kept asking himself the question, why doesn't Marxism work? Um, and he came to the conclusion that Marxism doesn't work because there are things that hold society together. Um, and if Marxism, again, uh, review from a few weeks ago, Marxism is, is the premise that there's these two groups. There is the oppressor class and the oppressed class, um, and that they, all, they have to fight each other. And after they fight each other, they can redistribute everything, and everybody's going to be happy. Uh, Marx used fancy words. Uh, he used the proletariat, which are the working class, 
um, the people who work in the factory and the bourgeoisie went to those who own the factory. Um, and so Marxism intentionally divides groups in order to pit them against one another, to level society, to usher in this, this Marxist utopia. And so as Gramsci was sitting in prison, um, he was wondering why didn't it happen? Why had it never worked? Um, every Marxist attempt had always ended very, very poorly. And spoiler alert, it still does. Uh, and so <coughs> he came up with the idea that there are all of these um, institutions that hold people together. Um, and so when we think about the institutions, the things like, like families um, or, or sports clubs um, or culture, like Western culture, and particularly the Christian church, are things that bind society together. Uh, and so he developed um, this, this thought of, oh, well, we got to tear these things down in order to divide people, in order to usher in a Marxist utopia. With me so far? I think he wants us confused as to why anybody thinks that that's a good idea. Yeah, everybody's confused about that. <laughs> uh, okay, and so then he developed, uh, not him, some of his, his followers, people who followed in his school of thought, developed a process called critical theory. And the idea behind critical theory was that if you criti criticize something enough, whether that criticism is warranted or just or fair or not, people will be embrace the criticism and want to, want to dismantle those systems of oppression, um, which is uh, the language that, we, that we're hearing today. And so today we're gonna talk about that and take it a step further and talk about where we see this taking place here in the United States. Um, and yes, today is the day we talk about critical race theory. Um, and we'll get to that in just a few minutes here. So if you have the workbook, we're on page 33. If you don't have the workbook, we're still on page 33. Uh, you can buy the workbook on Amazon. Um, just type in Christians in a woke world Bible study, it'll come up. All right, page 33. In the last section, we discussed Gramsci's idea to overthrow the culture to achieve the goals of Marxism. But the question is, did it become a reality? Gramsci envisioned an army of Marxist intellectuals gradually controlling all the key institutions of civil society, um, by what, but by what was later referred to as, quote, the long march through the institutions of power, end quote. So in Gramsci's words, again, quote, in the new order, socialism will triumph by first capturing the culture, culture via infiltration, bunch of fill in the blanks here, um, of schools, universities, churches, and the media um, by transforming the consciousness of society. Let me say those again. Schools, universities, churches, and the media by transforming the consciousness of society. And so Gransky was thinking, how do, we, how do we bring these institutions down? Well, you have to infiltrate them, and which are the most important ones to infiltrate? And they are schools, churches, universities, and the media in order to transform the way people think about society. So in 1923, followers of his ideas, Frederick Pollock, Max um, Horkheimer, um, Karl Grunberg, and other intellectual members and sympathizers of the Marxist Communist Party set up the Institute of Social Research at Frankfurt University in Weimar, German, in Weimar Germany. Uh, later it would become known simply as just the Frankfurt School. Uh, like Gramsci, uh, these new Marxists espoused that Marxism could only flourish, uh, Marxism could only flourish after the long march through the cultural institutions such as academies, seminaries, newspapers, magazines, radio, film, mass media, etc. So the only way for Marxism to work was to, again, get everybody who's Marxist into the institutions to tear down the institutions from the inside. So they're actually trying to teach the vision in seminaries? We'll talk about that today, um, and some of them. It's called liberation theology, and we'll talk about that towards the end of our lesson, or of our study today. But yes, there are um, a false form of Christianity um, a, a, which is a Marxist Christianity, which was called liberation theology. That, that's a little bit of an oxymoron, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. We'll talk about what it is and who teaches it and why it's really, really popular in the United States. Um, we'll get there in, in towards the end of today's lesson. So, no spoilers. 
Um, the new mantra of the Marxists was this, change the Western culture and the workers would unite. Change the Western culture and the workers will unite. Now, Willy Munzenberg, a leading Marxist scholar, stated explicitly that its goal was to, quote, organize the intellectuals and use them to make Western civilization sink. All right, flag on the play here. What do we got? I'm sorry, we'll expand that. <laughs> I apologize for that. Oh, hi. Good to see you. Thanks for tuning in. Glad that you're here. Okay, um, so when the Nazis come into power in 1933, most members of the Frankfurt School were forced to flee the country because they were not just communists, but also Jewish. So initially, they relocated to Geneva, where they had already had a satellite campus, but eventually, they settled in the United States. In 1935, the Institute of Social Research affiliated itself with Columbia University. Um, the Frankfurt School existed as a think tank to corrupt traditional Christian values of Western culture with pseudo-values included under the umbrella term of cultural Marxism. Um, and you can, you can go back and you can track this, the teachings of critical race theory, where it was first taught and who taught it, and trace it back to this Frankfurt School and its partnership with Columbia back in the 1930s. Um, and, and we do. Okay, that's kind of a brief overview. Now we're going to take a look at all of those things individually. We're going to take the long, slow march, only not as long or as slow through Bible study, and take a look at each of these institutions. Uh, page 34. So Gramsci specifically stated that his desire was to infiltrate and to transform universities, schools, the media, and churches. Those four things. Um, and so our question is tonight, do you see evidence of this? in those four institutions here in the States today. Do you see culture Marxism in universities, in schools, in the media, and in churches? Three and four, definitely. Um, I think here in this church I've had a little bit of a hard time seeing it, but on the other hand... <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Pope Francis is getting into the mix of things. Sure. Um, you know, as far as acceptance of, I, and I don't know if this falls in, but you know, he, he's encouraging the acceptance of um, gay unions. Yeah, that's not necessarily a Marxist idea. Um, while it is a wrong idea, it's not a Marxist idea. Um, because that would be an idea that's meant to unite but rather than divide. Seem to have a lot of politically charged opinions sure. when he shouldn't. Yeah, it's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, pastors in their official capacity try not to talk about politics. Um, and he's done, uh, you know, the job that he's done um, in, in that. Um, but, um, yeah, we're going to go through these um, one at a time. So my wife told me, um, that you folks online have a, a, a challenge um, responding to my questions because there's the delay from, you, from me saying it to you seeing it and then thinking about it and then typing it on your phone because phone keyboards are notoriously hard to type on, responding it and then me seeing it again in order to respond to it live term. Um, and so uh, don't let that uh, scare you away. <laughs> type in your questions. I'm happy to circle back to whatever your answers were if I don't see them in time. Um, so we can continue to talk about it. Um, yeah, okay, well, let's go on then. Question 7a. Universities, again, going through them one at a time. In 2006, so this would have been 16 years ago. People in 2006 can drive now. It's a weird thing. A poll of American, um, a poll of American sociology professors, 18% um, self-identify as Marxist. Um, with some polls putting that number as high as 25%. This was 16 years ago. Um, you had a one in five shot of being taught by a Marxist, uh, self-espoused Marxist at a university. Um, so here in the United States, um, in, again, 16 years ago, it's the numbers have increased since then, um, you had this chance. Does this, um, this statistic, in any way help explain why the values of Christian youth abruptly change when they go to college? Yes. 
Yeah, I would like to think so. Yeah. Um, because Marxism is expressly anti-Christian, um, as we've been exploring, that the whole purpose of this Bible study uh, to go through and talk about that. Yeah, and so one of the things that, that we then, as, as, as a church, uh, and, and y'all as parents, um, uh, a goal that we can work towards and work towards together is preparing our children for encountering these um, different views when they get to college. Um, to prep them to say, hey, you're going to hear things that aren't Christian, and this is how you, this is how you interact with them. Um, as we move forward. Great. Second one, and here it is, critical race theory. Schools. A uh, very hot, as he says here, issue is the teaching of critical race theory in schools. A critical race theory is critical theory applied to the matter of race. It's a key philo philosophy of culture Marxism, and its main claim is this. All of American society is based on white supremacy. Say that again. Its key theme is this. All of American society is based on white supremacy. Critical race theory teaches the people to see every matter, every issue, every, every matter, every matter in society in terms of a racial power dynamic, specifically white people oppressing minority groups. Um, and so again, critical theory is a tool to divide people, and critical race theory divides people by races, and it has these two categories, the proletariat, the bourgeoisie, oppressor and oppressed. If you're white, you're an oppressor. If you're not white, you're oppressed. And critical race theory wants us to see the entirety of American culture through this lens. Not just history, but all of American culture through this, through this lens. Um, recall from the last week, we talked about the Ohio State professor. Right, again, Ohio State, one of the most prominent college football universities in our, in our nation, where a Ohio State professor wrote an article talking about that it would be a good idea to play college football again, um, so that way people could be, you know, be healthy. But he was called a racist because of critical race theory. And they saw that as, this, as a football game, looking at through this power dynamic, oppressor and oppressed, white versus non-white, that white people were using black people, the players, for their privileged entertainment and for their view of societal healing. Again, in critical race theory, every interaction in society, all of them, is seen through the lens of a racial power dynamic, oppressor and oppressed, everything. I guess when um, the particular coach was suggesting that there are no white no white football players. Yeah. Yep. They don't count. And we'll talk about that today too. Uh, when we get that'll be so after this after this lesson we're gonna go to our next lesson, which we'll talk about intersectionality. <laughs> and then the last lesson we'll talk about Christianity. Uh, and we'll sweep through it all today. Okay, so there have been a whole bunch of stories of critical race theory over the last the last year, two years now from when this was when this Bible study was written. Um, and these are, are real things that took place. And I'm just going to list them off to you. That schools claimed traditional approaches to math education include getting the correct answer promotes racism and white supremacy. So you're doing math, and math has become racist. Um, insisting that assignments being turned in on time is, is racist. Um, that objectivity is, is racist. There is even a story of a fourth grade class that read a book warning students that police are, quote, mean to black people, but, quote, nice to white people, and that the police don't like black men. Real things being taught in real schools um, in our nation. And you can see how this is working out, right? This is, this is Marxism. This is its tool at work. It's intentionally seeking to divide people in two groups, oppressors and oppressed, and using critical theory to tear down society by dividing everybody into those categories and making them fight each other. This is how Marxism works, and we can see it play out um, in, our, in our colleges and in our school system. And so the question then is this. Are values such as objectivity, responsibility, punctuality, correct answers, are those values born out of racism? Spoiler alert, the answer is no. Right? Why did you say that? 
because responsibility is God wants us to be responsible yeah. for, our, for our actions. <laughs> right, because because we have God, right? We have this this question reveal that we hold up that the truth of it all. That Jesus Christ is real, that God is real, that truth is a real thing. Um, and so that we believe these things to be reflections of who God is. Um, and so they are, you know, true is true, false is false. Um, which isn't the case in critical race theory. Okay. Okay. Um, as of May in 2021, critical race theory has been formally challenged in 20 states. I'm not sure what the statistic was. I didn't look it up today. I'm sure it's higher now, um, which means clearly it is it is being taught across the country. Uh, so another question to ponder, and you don't have to answer this all out, um, is how do you feel about school children, perhaps your child, your grandchild, niece, nephew, being taught that he or she is an oppressor racist or a helpless victim that needs to overthrow the system? Because that's what critical race theory is teaching. Or, on the other hand, that your child or grandchild, whatever, is an oppressed victim who can do nothing to help himself fight other than fight the system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there has been a surge in homeschooling and a surge in enrollment in, in um, private schools. Uh, so I know at... Um, Sion and Alexandria, just up the road here, they've had an explosion in requests for, um, for enrollment, um, not just from Christians, but from non-Christians and um, alike, because they don't want their kids to be taught critical race theory. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, question, flag on the plane. <clears throat> I think humans across the globe would be incredibly offended by the idea that responsibility, intelligence, and correct answers belong only to one culture. Yeah. Yep. Psychologically speaking, viewing yourself as a victim all the time is incredibly damaging. Absolutely it is. Couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, which is why, uh, what, why we are so, so excited to have Jesus and to talk about the cross um, where Jesus has come to take it away, take it, where Jesus has taken away our guilt and shame and all of those things and liberated the captive and, and set us free. Um, great. Fantastic. Okay. Where are we? Oh, we have to watch a video now. Okay. So, uh, the media. So, we took a look at uh, universities and schools. Now we're going to go to the media. Um, so, back to my slide. I'm really bad at pushing buttons on a slide, so I'm, I'm sorry, guys. Marxism in America. It's not even on the, on the screen yet. Wrong button. Marxism in America. I mean, it took me a whole bunch of seconds to make that beautiful slide for you. Anyway, okay. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at the video of an interview with the prosecutor um, from the Derek Chauvin trial. So remember Derek Chauvin? Um, uh, <coughs> What, what, what I'm looking for. He's under prosecution for the for the things that he did in, in St. Louis. Um, that's, uh, he's a police officer, right? Uh, and so now the prosecutor who prosecuted him is in an interview. And that's what we're watching. So this is um, a, a, a 60 minutes interview with Ms. Minnesota Attorney General um, Keith Ellison. Um, and we're going to watch this here. Well, I'm going to watch it. <laughs> Make sure there's no ads. Okay, we'll put this up here. I'll put the link in the tab um, so you guys on the internet can watch this as well. Um, you want to start right about 5.15 um, is where we're at.
you're going to watch from 5.15 to 7 minutes. So we're going to watch just a little bit of the video here. The other is the motive for the murder. Can you hear it? Was this a hate crime? I wouldn't call it that. Because hate crimes are crimes where there's an explicit motive and uh, of bias. We don't have any evidence that Derek Chauvin factored in uh, George Floyd's race as he did what he did. You could have charged him with a hate crime under Minnesota law, and you chose not to. Could have, um, but we only charge those crimes that we had evidence to, that we put in front of a jury to prove. If we had a witness that told us that Derek Chauvin made a racial reference, we might have charged him with a say, hate crime. But I would have needed a witness to say that on the stand. We didn't have it, so we didn't do it. The whole world sees this as a white officer killing a black man because he is black. And you're telling me that there's no evidence to support that. In our society, there is a social norm that killing certain kinds of people is more tolerable than other kinds of people. In order for us to stop and pay serious attention to this case and be outraged by it, it's not necessary that Derek Chauvin has specific racial in intent uh, to harm George Floyd. The fact is, we know that through housing patterns, through employment, through wealth, through a whole range of other things, uh, so often people of color, black people, end up with uh, harsh treatment from law enforcement. Um, and other folks doing the exact same thing just don't. Okay, um, we're back. Okay, so, do you agree um, that the predominant theme of the media coverage was the oppression of the black community by police? Absolutely. All right, so Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison in this interview was asked the question, uh, why was it not prosecuted as a hate crime when, um, as the interviewer said, quote, all of the world sees it as a white officer killing a black man. Um, Ellison then admitted there in the interview that there was no evidence of racial animus. But by framing the entire horrific event as an oppressor group versus an oppressed group, it took a cultural Marxist angle and further divided people by putting one group against another. All right, my, my purpose for showing this to you isn't to say that Derek Chauvin did the right thing, right? He didn't. No. He acted very poorly, you know, murdered a guy. Um, the purpose of showing this is that how society was trying to, to frame it, um, in the words of the interview, the whole world seeing it as a white officer killing a black man, as the attorney general then said, it wasn't racially motivated. And when I look at it, I see it as a police officer interacting with a criminal. Mm -hmm. The color of their skin has nothing to do with it. Yeah, um, if you if you have time, you can watch the rest of that interview um, <coughs> where the attorney general goes through and describes what what he think was the motivation for it, and goes on and expresses how they charged Chauvin and all of that as that case is played out and Chauvin's in jail now. Um, but again, we can see those those cultural Marxist angles, critical race theory, everything everything must be seen through the lens of race. Let's go on then. So the last one then is the church. Um, so we had, the, we had the three, we had universities, we had schools, we had the media, now we have the church. Um, the last of our, our institutions we're talking about this evening. So the church, in major sections of the Christian church, um, social gospel um, has replaced the true biblical gospel. Um, what is the social gospel? Social gospel is the application of Christian ethics to social problems, 
such as poverty, poor nutrition, education, crime, war, social issues. Unfortunately, these things are emphasized at the expense of teaching, where there is expense, at the expense of teaching sin, salvation, heaven, and hell, and most importantly, at the expense of teaching Jesus dying on the cross to save us from our sins. In other words, fixing society, fixing society is the social gospel. And so while the origins of this movement aren't Marxist, they have found themselves to be partners because of their shared ideology. Some prominent theologians from mainstream Christian denominations even credit Marx for the church's social interests. Um, churches who no longer regard the Bible as the inspired word of God often preach this so-called social gospel. Um, we'll talk more about that. So in, in our Sunday morning Bible studies, it's one of the things that we talk about not infrequently is when you put something in front of the word gospel, you have corrupted the gospel. If you put prosperity in front of the word gospel, it's not the real gospel. If you put social in front of the gospel, it's not the real gospel. Um, and this is another example of that, because then the gospel is lost for the sake of that word in front of it. Um, the gospel being that Jesus Christ was born, lived, and died on the cross uh, to forgive us from our sins, rose again from the dead and now lives and reigns, and one day he's going to take us to be with him. Uh, that message is lost, um, in the sake of, for the prosperity gospel, that message is lost um, for the sake of having wealth and happiness and a prosperous life on the earth. For the social gospel, that message is lost for fixing all of society's problems, um, whatever those problems might be. Okay. So we call from the introduction to the section this phrase, um, the long march through institutions. When one looks at the state of universities, schools, medias, and churches, one could argue that the long march is almost complete. It is seen in the culture of Wittgenhub, endless division, the media that is short on reporting facts and long on pressing an agenda on a society where everything has been politicized. Um, Vladimir Lenin once said, give me one generation of youth and I'll transform the world. Um, and then what are your thoughts on this? You can keep those thoughts to yourself if you want to. I'm not gonna make you write them out. Um, but let's go on. So the presence of culture and Marxist ideology in our major institutions can be concerning, even frightening, to Christians. How do the following verses provide comfort and strength for Christians while living in these great and latter days? Specifically, what does God promise? And so we have two passages here um, that will talk about these issues. The first one is Psalm 23, familiar words um, from verses 4 through 6. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And from Matthew 16, And I tell you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So what do these two passages have to do with this long march? It's not going to destroy Christianity. God is with us. God will protect us. And God will protect his church and see his church through. His rod and his staff will comfort us, lead us to green pastures and still waters. The gates of hell themselves will not conquer the gospel. Um, yeah. And so while we may face persecutions, as Christians have throughout history, um, Christianity is still here, and it's not going anywhere. All right, final thoughts on this chapter. The evidence of the long march through the institutions is seen, it's currently seen, in our schools, our churches, and our media. Christians must ever hold fast and proclaim God's law and gospel. But at the same time, while we live in the shadow, we are at peace because God is with us. Jesus has won the victory over sin, death, and the power of the devil. Not even the gates of hell prevail against his church, and that is against his people. All right. Any questions about critical race theory or any about this chapter? Um, I will give you on the internet a minute here to respond. Urban areas. Urban areas? Well, 
rather than rural, like our roads all turn to you know smaller towns. Yeah. I mean, you say that. Um, you know, this Bible study was written in Alexandria, uh, which isn't what we well, would think Alexandria of as a. Alexandria isn't New York. It's not Houston. It's not San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it's it's not seen as a liberal place. Um, as far as cities go, they would classify themselves as you know a conservative city. Do we have any flags on the play here? All right, well, let's go on then. Chapter 8, we're on page 37. If you're just joining us, we're in our workbook, uh, page 37. All right, so we just kept on talking about that cultural Marcus thinking intentionally targets the church. Um, nowhere is this more prevalent than in the black American church, um, which was greatly influenced by Marxism in the mid-1900s. Today, today, about 40% of black American churches identify with something called liberation theology. Uh, this includes thousands of congregations from the Church of God in Christ and the African Methodist Episcopal Church. This theology, liberation theology, is distinctly American, and it started on July 1st, 1966. Uh, when there were 51 pastors and they purchased a full page ad in the New York Times demanding a more aggressive approach to eradicating racism. Um, its main teaching is that Christianity exists not to save souls, but to liberate the oppressed black community. America in its racist history is the oppressor. And if it sounds like Marxist theology, that's because it is Marxist theology. I'm a leading proponent, if not the leading proponent of black liberation theology, um, James Cone, wrote these words in an essay he wrote in 1980. Why not think of a completely new society and begin to devise ways to realize that on this earth? Perhaps what we need today is to return to that, quote, good old time religion, quote, of our grandparents and combine it with a Marxist critique of society. Together, black religion and Marxist philosophy may show us the way to build a completely new society. So Cohn argued here that Jesus reveals himself as a black oppressed person in order to disrupt and dismantle white oppression. Multiple times, he writes of the need to combine Marxism with Christianity. So Christians must understand that the Marxist ideas of liberation theology have undermined a major section of Christianity. It's in the Christian church in the United States and not, not a small portion of it. It's not fringe. Okay, so let's do this here. All right, so in a recent forum, um, um, Ibram Kennedy, a leading anti-racist author and speaker and liberation theology proponent, contrasted liberation theology with the biblical gospel, which he calls savior theology. Um, savior theology, according to this man, is to go out and save these individuals who are behaviorally deficient. In other words, we are to bring them into the church, these individuals who are doing all these evil, sinful things, and then heal them and save them. And once we've saved them, we've done our job. And so I've got that interview. I want to watch it with you. Um, skip ahead, skip ahead to this one. When you went across, do you... Sorry, this is taking so long. I'm gonna get this all figured out. Uh, can't hear it. Role that churches or communities of faith can play in this anti-racist movement. So I, yeah, I'm a preacher's kid, and, and my parents pretty much met what was known as the Black Power Movement, but more specifically for them, the movement um, 
for black theology, and so they were both Christians who, who imagined that the church was supposed to be an engine of liberation, that Christianity was supposed to be a source of liberation for black people and humanity. They looked at Jesus as black <laughs> with a fro, like they had their fro's. Um, and, and what I sort of ultimately realized in, in analyzing the form of Christianity that they were raised in, particularly the, during the black theology movement, and sort of just, I should say, contrasting that with the form of Christianity that 80% of white evangelicals have when they voted for Donald Trump. Um, I think one of the ways we can distinguish it is one being liberation theology. In other words, Jesus was a revolutionary. <laughs> and the job of the Christian is to revolutionize society. That the job of the Christian is to liberate society from the powers on, on earth that are oppressing humanity. Everybody understand that? So that's liberation theology in a nutshell. Savior theology is a different type of theology. The job of the Christian is to go out and save these individuals who are behaviorally deficient. In other words, we're to bring them into the church, these individuals, who are doing all of these evil, sinful things, and heal them, and save them. And then once we've saved them, we've done our jobs. And, and to me, anti-racists fundamentally reject savior theology. That goes right in line with racist ideas and racist theology, in which they say, you know what, black people, other racial groups, the reason why they're struggling on earth is because of what they're behaviorally doing wrong. And it is my job as the pastor to sort of save these wayward black people, or wayward poor people, or, or wayward queer people. That type of theology breeds bigotry. And, and so to me, the type of theology, of liberation theology, breeds a common humanity, a common humanity against the structures of, of power that, that oppress us all. All right, so, chance to watch that. I can see your questions again. Okay, so while Christians do not entirely agree with his definition of savior theology, we don't. Uh, do you agree that Christians are called here, uh, that we as Christians are, are to call people to repent for their sin and find healing and forgiveness of sins provided in our Savior Jesus Christ? Is that what Christians are supposed to do? Yeah, he said it in a weird way. Um, he said that it's our job to go out and save people. And that's not our job. Um, only Jesus can save people. I think um, it's our job to enlighten people yeah. and bring them to Christ, yeah. but not necessarily forgive them. Right, right. Because we can't. Because forgiveness comes from Christ alone. Right, and so we say in, in our explanation to the Apostles' Creed, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord to come to him, but that he has called me by the gospel and lied to me by his gifts. Um, sanctified and kept me, whatever, it keeps going. <laughs> Command me work, confirmation students. Um, and so while we, our job isn't to save people, our job is to proclaim the gospel, and then the Holy Spirit uses that to call people to faith. Right, as, as it says in Luke 24, um, Thus it is written that Jesus Christ would suffer and on the third day rise from the dead for the repentance and for the forgiveness of sins, that that should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. Um, and so our job isn't to go out and then to um, usher in a better society um, for the oppressed groups by bringing them to repentance. 
but rather that their souls would be saved because they would be led by the Holy Spirit to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Big difference between how, how um, Kennedy talks about, um, Kennedy, I'm sorry, I'm saying it wrong. Kennedy talks about um, saver sir theology versus actual Christian theology. And contrasting that, um, he says that liberation theology teaches that Jesus is, quote, a revolutionary. And the job of the Christian is to revolutionize society. And the job of the church is to liberate society from the powers that oppress humanity. Are Christians called to be part of liberating the oppressed? Good question. Yes. We are called to help liberate the oppressed. Uh, consider this Jeremiah 22 thus says the Lord do justice and righteousness deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who has been robbed do no wrong or violence to the resident alien the fatherless and the widow nor shed innocent blood in this place um, we've talked about this since day one under this study that yes God wants us to take care of the take care of the oppressed right um, the widows the orphans the sojourners um, which is what is here in, in Jeremiah 22. To care for those who don't have that safety net. To help, to help those who would be in a position to be taken advantage of. To prevent them from being taken advantage of. Um, that we as Christians are to liberate the oppressed. But we do so, we do so in a very different way than what Marxism teaches. So, all of that being said. Is Jesus our savior from sins or a revolutionary liber liberator? Um, consider this, um, the very name of Jesus, which, he's, which the Father gave to him. Um, the name Jesus means the Lord saves. Um, she will give birth to a son, and you are to call him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So is Jesus part of savior theology? Yes. Does following Jesus mean following savior theology? Yes, just not in the way that Candy describes. Um, so according to the Father himself, what is Jesus saving us from? Is he saving us from an uncomfortable life here on earth? No, no he's not. He's not saving us from oppression on earth. He's not saving us from uncomfortable lives on earth. He's not saving us from those things. He's saving us from sin, death, and the power of the devil. And that's what he's come to save us from. Marxism and liberation theology desire heaven upon earth, but Jesus did, did, but did Jesus come to set up an earthly kingdom? Right. So Marxism wants an earthly utopia. Liberation theology wants an earthly utopia under the name of Christianity. Is that what Jesus came to do? Well, for that we turn to Jesus' own words in John chapter 18. When Pontius Pilate asked him, "Are you the King of the Jews?" Jesus said, "My kingdom is not of this world." If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting for me that I would not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. So is Jesus' kingdom on this world? No. 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 So based on these verses alone, and there's more in the Bible, um, it's pretty clear that Jesus was sent in love by the Father to be our Savior from sin. Jesus did not come to set up an earthly utopia. Yet read Jeremiah again. Are Christians excused from caring about what happens here on earth? Jeremiah says, Do justice and righteousness and deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who has been robbed. Do no wrong, no violence to the resident alien, the fatherless, the widow, and don't shed innocent blood. Are we, supposed, are we excused from caring about our neighbor? No. We're supposed to care about our neighbor. Very much so. We're supposed to stand up and care about and serve our neighbor. Is it possible then that the historic lack of care of the Christian church in America for those experiencing racism allowed for the rise of liberation theology. Possible. It is possible, yeah. Something to consider as we move forward. Um, in what ways has the Christian church failed to live up to its obligations that Christ has given to us and these other things have set in its place? And we'll continue to explore that question as we move forward.
Do you, do you have a thought? You could say, you could say it's fine. Yeah. No, I was just thinking that there are a lot of churches in the Middle East that don't follow the gospel the way it was intended. Yeah. And that kind of takes them off the path. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and so um, we'll explore um, this exact question in, in great detail the last three chapters of this Bible study. Um, we'll talk about what we as the Christian church have done wrong, have done right, and can do, continue to do moving forward. Um, can I can do better? Yes. Yes. Um, so the 95 Theses, um, I talked about this a lot. Um, the first thesis, uh, thesis uh, Luther wrote was um, when our Lord says to repent and believe the gospel, he means that the Christian life is a life of repentance. You don't just repent one time, you constantly repent. And so yes, we can repent of how we've done things before, and we can continue to try to strive to do better. Um, and we will continue to do that, and we'll talk about that as we go forward. Um, but it's something to consider um, and ponder over the next couple of days, weeks, as we get to that point. Or what are ways that we as Christians can step up and respond to these cultural issues in a way that's appropriate um, with our theology and, and, and not Marxist. I have answers, just not today. I want you to think about it. Okay, let's go on then. So liberation theology does not accept savior theology as discussed by Kendi. And that teaches Jesus is our savior from sin who cares for the downtrodden. Kendi said that it's right in line with racist ideas and racist ideology. In short, Ibram Kendi considers traditional Christianity, traditional Christian ministry to be racist. Kendi concluded that savior theology is racist because it tells people the reason they're struggling on earth is because um, of their sinful deeds rather than um, oppressive power systems. Not system structures, oppressive power structures. What do you mean? Well, by suggesting that the Savior theology is racist, isn't that like saying God is racist? His gospel is racist? Ah, uh, I don't know how, how you would answer that. I would imagine he would say no. Um, but he has very different ideas, understandings of what it's supposed to do. Right? His understanding is false and is, is an anti Christian understanding. And so I'm not quite sure what he would say um, about it. Um, I just don't know. Okay. Yeah. okay. He also said that this, this type of savior theology breeds bigotry. In other words, Kendi is saying that you are not responsible for your actions or the consequences of them. Proclaiming repentance of sins isn't just bigotry, uh, but it's um, breeding bigotry. In liberation theology, oppressive power structures cause all problems, and if you don't get on board with that thinking, you are a racist. All right, fly ahead and play. We got here. Not related, a different message from somebody else. Okay, let's go on. So, what does this mean for Christian ministry? Liberation theology excuses a person in an oppressed group from reflecting on his thoughts and actions and repenting. Consequently, suggesting that an oppressed person um, may need to repent is considered racist. Liberation theology eliminates the very thing that Jesus told us to do repentance and forgiveness of sins in his name. Okay. Once again, the words of Kendi demonstrate that Marxist thinking and Christianity are not compatible. Kendi understands this, so he had to make up a new form of Christianity. Um, do we? Do we understand this? Well, I hope so, as we're going forward here. Okay. What's that? Pretty quiet tonight. Inmates have comments. They're doing pretty good. The next one we get them. Yeah, lots of discussion. Consider the most famous incident of American black liberation theology. In 2008, Jeremiah Wright, a liberation theology pastor who was the then candidate Barack Obama's pastor, 
famously uttered the words, not God bless America, but God damn America, in a sermon where he blamed America for the 9-11 attacks. Um, these are incomprehensible words to many people unless you understand liberation theology. In Wright's liberation theology, the main oppressor is America, right? And its racist structures. So thus, the 9-11 attacks were simply America getting what it deserved, justice for the oppressed. So if reading, about li if reading about liberation theology makes you angry, pause for a moment and consider the words of the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3. What is Paul's emotion for feeling this way? He says, For as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. How does Paul feel about it? Sorrow. Because he wants them to be saved. Okay. So then, um, last paragraph here, who was Ibram Kendi? Probably should have led with this. Um, apologize for that. Why are we talking about him? Uh, he's a professor at Boston University. He's a number one New York Times best-selling author. Um, he goes around the nation and leads anti-racist training. Um, he lectures at many events and, and corporations. This is paid thousands of dollars by countless businesses to teach people how to be anti-racist. His third book, the number one New York best-selling author, is How to Be an Anti-Racist. He recently re released another book, which is also incredibly popular, The Anti-Racist Baby. His influence is immense in our nation. One of his most famous quotes is this. The only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. He unapologetically advocates for discrimination if it results in equality and equity. He further stated the greatest threat to anti-racist movement is people being colorblind, that is, treating people equally no matter who they are. Yes. That's the goal. Okay, last reflection on this chapter. Liberation theology is a toxic combination of Marxist philosophy and heretical theology, shaping what many people think about God and society. It's a theological framework strictly designed to accomplish a Marxist revolution for the oppressed. The theology can be extremely aggravating to Christians, and yet anger is not the appropriate response. Sadly, the true gospel of Jesus Christ, the one who lived and died and was rescued, resurrected for all sinners, no matter their race or position, has been deemed racist. Instead of loving and respecting every soul to the end of oppression, the answer of liberation theology is to pit people against each other and to avoid personal responsibility and avoid repentance. It's tragic. The church's ministry, with the help of the Spirit, is to shape people through the gospel to the image of Christ. Any questions about that? Okay, one more. I'm going to do the three lessons today. Um, it's a shorter lesson, but I think it's good. We're going to talk about the word woke, and we're going to talk about intersectionality. Becoming woke to your oppression score, intersectionality. Perfect. Okay. Another excellent, high-quality slide. <laughs> <laughs> An important but less familiar word in the vocabulary of cultural Marxism is intersectionality. Intersectionality is a way of measuring just how oppressed a person is by the number of oppressed groups that that person is assigned to. Your intersectionality score can determine the amount of power you have in society, your moral authority, and whether or not you should be held responsible for your actions. We'll learn more about intersectionality today, and then next week, um, we'll biblically assess it. And so we're going to talk about it today, and then next week we'll talk about how the Bible specifically addresses intersectionality, just because we don't have time tonight. Um, so here's a video. Is critical theory biblical? Um, the video is too long to watch here in class. I'll share it online later if you want to watch it. Um, it's powered by the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. Um, intersectionality is a way to measure your level of oppression based on how many oppressed groups you're assigned to. Right? And so this is the basic definition of intersectionality. 
It's a way to measure your oppressive level of oppression based on how many oppressed groups that you are assigned to. Right? So you don't get to, get to choose them, they're assigned on you. For instance, if you're a black, female, homosexual, atheist who's impoverished, you have an intersectionality score of five because you belong to five oppressed groups. Blacks, females, homosexuals, atheists, and those and the poor. If you're a black Christian man, you've got a score of one. Being black is seen as oppression, but being Christian and a man, those two, those two categories are seen as privilege. And so if you want to, you can take a moment and figure out what is your intersectionality score. Okay, notice, <laughs> notice that your score is not calculated on your personal virtue. It's not based on your actions or even events that have impacted your life personally. It is only based on your group identity. Right? And upon nothing else about your individual person or your life or your times or your character, it's just based on these arbitrary groups that you've been assigned to. Would you consider the highly paid, well-respected, black, female, billionaire, media executive, and philanthropist, professional talk show host, and actress, Oprah, would she be oppressed? What's her intersectionality score? It's higher than mine. Well, she's black and she's female, that's two. If you go according to this. Yeah. So why does your intersectionality score matter? Um, according to critical theory, the higher the score, the more oppressed you are. The more oppressed you are, the less moral responsibility you have because you're a victim of the system. Hence the term systemic racism. In other words, you may not be held responsible for your actions. So the greater your intersectionality score, the least responsible you are, you're a victim of the system, of systemic racism or whatever else it is and you're not responsible for your place in life or for the actions that you take you're just a victim of your circumstances conversely uh, with a high, while a high intersectionality score gives you less moral responsibility it gives you more moral authority and so you have less responsibility but your words carry greater weight in our society that is to say the more oppressed a person is, the more you must listen and respect their words. So you're saying that Oprah Winfrey, being a black female millionaire businesswoman, has more moral authority than a pastor? Yes. I'm pretty sure I have a negative score. And all the, the the oppressor groups that I'm a part of, I would have a negative score. Right? I'm white, Western culture. I'm straight. I'm male. I'm a priest. And those are all all of the oppressor groups. I have a high oppressor score, I guess. <laughs> That's fine. I remember a couple weeks ago we talked about that college student who asked Ben Shapiro show how he, as a white, well-off religious man, could justify having an opinion on abortion. Um, in her view, Shapiro had no moral authority. Um, he didn't have enough of the boxes checked off for intersectionality and no right for his opinion because his interse intersectionality score was zero in, in her mind. Um, those who are less oppressed the white, the heterosexual, Christian, non-impoverished male, that would be me, <laughs> uh, gain moral authority by giving up the rights to a valid thought to those who are more oppressed. This is called being woke. Being woke is the Marxist term for waking up to the fact that you are an oppressor and you repent of your quote-unquote sins. I wish I got the right word here. Yep. Um, that's, this is to say that being woke is repenting of who you are based on your identity group, not because you actually, con not because you actually committed a sin. It's you repent on being your identity, not what you've done. 
Um, in other words, being woke is repenting of who God made you. In the same way. Yeah. To, to wake into the oppression. Okay. Yep. Yep. In the same way, if you are identified as a member of an oppressed group, being woke is waking up to the fact that you are oppressed and that you must overcome your oppression, even if you're living a happy life. So being woke as part of an, as part of an oppressed group is um, overcoming your oppression even if you've never been oppressed. So in Oprah's case, it's overcoming her oppression, even though she's all of those things that we listed off earlier. That's what wokeism and Marxism would, would teach. As an example of woke repentance, in the aftermath of the Capitol riot, um, former CIA director John Brennan, who opposed the riot, had nothing to do with the riot, stated that he was embarrassed to be a white man. In essence, he apologized for being part of an oppressive ideological group, which is what makes it, which in his mind makes him an oppressor. So there is an event that took place. Um, he didn't like it, didn't approve of it, as the rest of us didn't like it and didn't approve of it. Um, and he apologized on behalf of his identity because similar people of similar identities did something wrong. He was embarrassed to be a white man. So it can be discouraging to live in a society that overlooks, sorry, that's my word here, that overlooks moral and personal responsibility in favor of judging people based upon their group identity, um, which is intersectionality, especially when the identity multiplies the sins of the oppressors and absolves the sins of the oppressed. As Christians, we believe that we are accountable to God. Will you be able to stand before God and declare your innocence based on how oppressed you were? So when you die and you stand before the judgment seat of God on it, and he's on his throne and he stands there judging all of your actions, will God absolve your sins because you were oppressed? No. No. According to Galatians 6, what's the only reason that we boast? The cross, um, be, it bar, sorry, be it far from me to boast in anything except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The only way that we're saved is through Jesus. We're not saved based on being oppressed. Excuse me. We're saved based on what Jesus has done. Okay. Last question of the night. Next week, we're going to talk about does Christianity have a solution to oppression? Yes. I'm what is it? Christ. Perfect. Um, think about that question. Think about an answer for it. Um, and see what you come up with. And we'll talk about that next week. So I'm giving you homework. What is Christianity's response to oppression? How do we engage this culture? How do we engage oppression? How do we engage all of these things um, in a biblical, biblically sound way? Perfect. All right, two concluding thoughts. Why the word woke? One of the most famous quotes of Karl Marx is, religion is the opium of the, religion is the, opium of the masses. Marx was trying to convince people that religion is like a drug, an illusory happiness used to numb them from their suffering and oppression. He argued that people find comfort in religion and thus don't fight against oppression like, oppression like they should. Marx wanted each person to wake up, to be woke, to get off the drug of religion and to quote, discard his illusions and regain his senses that he will move around himself on his own son. Though he did not coin or use the term woke, Marx wanted people to wake up and take control of their lives, which he believed were hindered by religion, specifically by Christianity. And some modern-day Marxists have drawn upon these words. All right, one last reflection. The ideology that your moral worth or moral responsibility is based upon your skin color, your gender, your income, or any other factor like this um, allows for great evil. It further allows oppressed people to feel justified in doing evil. As Christians, we are always to examine our thoughts, words, and deeds in light of God's word. 
where we sin, we repent, and we find God's love and forgiveness under the cross of Christ. Where there's oppression, we need to work to end it, without creating a different form of uh, without creating a different form of oppression as found in cultural Marxism. That's your challenge, dear Christians watching this. Uh, we are to end oppression without being Marxist. So when you come back next week, I expect answers. How are we going to end oppression without being Marxist? Let's close with prayer. Lord, your son came as our good shepherd, loving and knowing each, each of us little lambs by name. Protect us from the lies of group identity and help us to love each individual as you love us in your son. In whose name we pray, amen. Thank you for joining us tonight. Have a wonderful evening. Again, if you have questions, please let me know. And I look forward to seeing you all next week.